without any further ado, what we'll do is we'll get into my first, into the first talk, which is around fluid simulation. Now, firstly, I have to apologize up front. I haven't done a lot of time to prepare this, so it's going to be a bit choppy in places as I sort of search for files and, uh, and the video. But hopefully, it'll all come together. So starting with the actual end product. So this is uh, what I actually produced. It was, I was a good friend of mine, runs a company called Campaign Coins, which for role-playing games, they're actually little metal coins that you can use and trade. So when you get gold pieces or Electrum or whatever else, for whatever game you're playing, you can actually physically get them. And he was engaged by a company, uh, I think it's called I think it's Black Hat Games, I think they're called, um, they do a game called Fate. And so he started, a, he created a Kickstarter campaign and he asked me to actually do the pro, the actual intro video. So what I'll do is we'll just play that for you now. So let me just set up sharing for this. There it is. Okay, so hopefully everybody in the world is seeing the video. We'll just let it go now. Hello from Melbourne, Australia. My name's Andre. And I'm Mark. So you can actually see this is the uh, Kickstarter campaign here. So if the video didn't play for whatever reason, go search uh, Kickstarter campaign coins and you'll get, uh, you'll get to see it. So we're back again. Um, there is also a chat function here as well, um, but we probably won't pay too much attention to that because otherwise that will distract from me actually speaking. So, right. So that was the final product. So, and that took about six weeks part time doing work because the fluid simulation turned into an absolute nightmare. So Blender's Fluid Sim is great. It's really powerful, but it has a couple of things that can be really counterintuitive and it uh, can be a bit of a challenge to get a consistent result. So like all good projects, when we started out, we started by actually giving a, um, a an idea of what it was going to look like. So let me just share the screen for that so you can see it. Ah, this is one of the challenges of Zoom. It's the first time we're using it. We can't see the full name of the files that we're trying to share. So I think this is correct. Uh, actually, it won't be because it won't be playing the right one. So let me try another one in a second. We have to actually start the animation playing first. Then hopefully I can share the right one. But the images are coming up. Apologies. How about I just share the desktop? then you can see everything. So uh, this was a, you can see here in the center of the screen, that this is a GL preview. So this is basically just done with the GL rendering option, uh, done very quick, a little bit of post-processing to give the glow around the uh, video, sorry, around the um, lava or the molten metal. And this can be generated very quickly. Uh, it didn't take me long to generate and it created the desired result. They said, yep, we're very happy with it, fantastic. If I actually look at the file in question, here you can see the actual file and uh, how everything is set up. Well, actually, here's a later version that, here's the first problem that I encountered. Um, but the, when I did the initial animatic, I did it purely with uh, keyframed locations. So basic transformations. So the crucible that you can see here, just put the controllers on. So the crucible that you can see here was just basically keyframe from this location to this location, which works fine. Uh, the fluid sim works well and so on. But to get a better animation, because as you may have noticed that the actual hooks, like the hooks disconnect from the crucible near the end, uh, to get a better animation, I wanted to create a rig. So we had the crucible and uh, the crucible here, 
and then these items, the, the hooks and the, the chain. So there would actually be a bit of a rig. And the problem was that whenever I put the rig in place, immediately the fluid starts dropping through the actual crucible. And that is because that when you set the options, I've got uh, some Zoom stuff in the way, and the options over here for the actual fluid sim, um, that's the sim, where is my fluid object? Metal fluid, there it is. So you can see it's set to volume, which is great. The actual item in question, I'll just turn it on, so you can see it was at the base of the actual crucible. Uh, so when it was gen when it basically was when it was generating, it was supposed to be inside the crucible. The crucible itself is a sh is a shell object, which is another thing. If you're going at convex object like this, it needs to be set to shell. If you set to volume, then it will treat the whole thing like a solid object, and your fluid sim will do crazy stuff. So don't. So basically, always go go shell. The next problem is that here. Once you create a rig or you create even a parenting relationship or constraint is you will have problems with the, you will have problems with this actual settings is that what will happen is that your, your fluid objects will then ignore the obstacles and they will just drop straight through into the ground, which is, yes, really, really, really annoying. So, and, and you can see exactly that's what's happened here. The way to fix it is that you have to do what's called here, turn on export animated mesh. And that will work for rigs, constraints, and parenting. Even simple parenting can break it, as I understand it. At least that was my experience. So uh, this is one of the first problems that we encountered, or correction, I encountered, I should say. The challenge has been, it's like once you get the export animated mesh, is it then changes, it actually changes the behavior of the, uh, of the fluid. Uh, it seems to work differently. And I had to do a lot of messing about to try and get the fluid to actually flow correctly. And one of the ways that I did that was actually, um, I'm not sure if it's in this file. Let me just see if I can open another file. Another one open. Yeah, here's a later version of it probably pretty close to final. Um, in this version here, uh, if I get to the fluid domain here, you'll see that I have, i go to the settings, I have actually keyframed the base and the exponent. So I actually changed the, the values over time so that you could actually, uh, I'll call them up in the graph editor. Should be able to see it. So the viscosity and the just on the uh, normalize. So you can see I've actually so there in the green line is the uh, the green line is the viscosity exponent, which is this one here, and the base is the red line here. So I've actually changed the viscosity and the exponent or the viscosity. Basically, I've just changed the, the viscosity over time to get the result I want. So it's very low to begin with, so that it stays in the crucible. Then when it hits the front of the crucible, it flies up in the air. So I wanted it to be a bit less, sort of like, you know, basically very runny, so it would fly nicely. And then finally, I actually then made it just run sort of at a steady rate to make it flow out at a rate that will match the camera moving down camera pans down. So it was a bit of a challenge. That took, again, a lot of tweaking to actually get the result I wanted. Uh, so yes, it was, it was difficult, but you can do it. So one of the other challenges that I had, though, was that, let me just get this up again. Uh, every time I changed this, I had to rebake. And that meant a lot of sitting around and and experimenting by using by changing some of the values uh, where are we in here the two there's this value here you can set that down to one that makes it a bit quicker 
And specifically around here, around final, using the final value here, this made a huge difference. If you go really, you know, if you make that a low value, it'll generate quickly. But the downside is that the higher the value, the smaller the subdivisions, the behavior of the fluid changes. So I wanted to have something that felt like it was heavy, it was big, it was thick, it was viscous. The more I turn this value up, the final resolution value, the more it broke up, the more sort of like little particles got created. So in the end, because I did some tests where I was running 400 on the resolution here rather than 256, and it actually stopped looking realistic. So sometimes the solution is not to just turn the resolution up. Sometimes you just have to accept that you have to deal with this challenge here. Let me just check. How am I going for time? Cool. We're doing well. So after a while, uh, after a, a few versions, I got to the point where, after a few versions, I actually got to the point where I was rendering the whole item end to end. So what I'll do is I'll just uh, find the, one of the interim versions that I did. So, love it. so what I'll do, so we'll play. So here is a test render a few, you know, sort of like a few bits in. So this one's, it says full render version three. I ended up with tons of different versions. Um, as you can see, there's some, clearly there's some issues here with the render. So uh, that would be the little end blurb there as well. First problem, you can see the back of the actual crucible, the fluid was running up the back. This is one where the viscosity obviously didn't work very well and we get a huge rain of uh, lava. We're not actually getting a nice kind of feel to it. There's some other artifacts and so on. And uh, so you get that nice little, yes, I know it is very cheesy, the uh, the white line across the coins and across the logo, but that's what was requested by the client. So that's what happens. So hopefully you're seeing this and this is all working. But you can see uh, there are lots of problems. Uh, the actual so if I go here, you can start seeing, if I've stopped it, you can see that the fluid is running up the back of the, of the crucible. And no matter what I tried, I could not stop that happening. Uh, I tried a number of things like you can give the fluid an initial direction, but that didn't seem to work. Uh, you could, I tried uh, something, which actually I'll show you what I tried that did not work. If I put this back to the 3D view, uh, is on the actual fluid object. Where is it? Fluid object. Inflow fluid. There it is. So you can see it at the back there of the crucible. Um, you can actually keyframe the enablement of the actual, whether it's enabled or not. And so I thought a really great way to solve my problem was that I would just. Um, basically disable it until the fluid got really close. You can see that, uh, where are we? So the, the, the challenge was that I wanted to basically disable it until the crucible came in and started swinging. Then I would enable the fluid, it would fill up and just as it hit, it would then splash up nicely and come back down. It would stop the problem of as it was running forward, the fluid running up the back of the actual uh, the crucible. Unfortunately, the problem is that when you turn off the fluid in the actual thing on the, the domain, if the domain has no fluid in it, it renders as a solid box. So that was bad. The way I tried to fix it was to put, I put another little bit of, I'll just show you what I, what I did. again. Um, uh, so what we what I did is, if I look around, you'll see I've got another fluid object here that is actually emitting. So that one would emit straight from the first frame, so that I would always have at one object at least emitting fluid in the frames, and then I would keyframe this fluid, the inflow fluid in here. 
So you can see it at the back of the crucible. That didn't work. Again, I had problems. It would not the flow flow would not work correctly. It would sometimes it would work, sometimes it wouldn't. Yeah, I couldn't get a reliable render out. So in the end, the way I actually fixed it uh, is to if I go back a bit further. You can see there is an object here. I'm pretty sure that's it. So if we go to the camera view, this object uh, is actually a cube that I used as a Boolean. So if I get the actual fluid and go to the modifiers, you can see that I've applied a Boolean here. And so what that does in this, and, where, and, and it's keyframe to work and not work, to turn on and off. So what happens is up until, uh, I think it's about, that's a little bit early. I think it's here. There we are. So up until this point, it's active. So what that does is that it cuts the top off the fluid. Um, I think you might. You can't actually see it because I think I've got it uh, disabled. No, it is actually uh, enabled. There you are. So you can see it's actually cutting off. So you can see the fluid inside the crucible. But if I look at it from over here, you'll see that it's actually cut off so that it's not, you can't see it running up the back of the actual crucible here. So the Boolean was the way to solve the problem. So that basically, uh, as you, as the, as the crucible came along, the fluid was, was actually running up, but it was being cut off. So it was great. So then what I did is I just turned the Boolean off just before the fluid came up to the top. So it stopped and started splashing up the front. So I turned the Boolean off just in time. This was a good solution and it worked really well. Uh, however, there was one problem with it that I didn't, didn't actually understand until I got to the near the end when I was doing the lighting. And I'm not sure I'm going to be able to uh, do this quick enough, but we'll see. Um, is that on this frame, so that it cuts it, it cuts it out on the next. Well, what mode have I gone into? I've done something silly. Yeah. So on this frame, the lava is not visible. On the next frame, the lava is visible. Actually, this might be not. I don't think this is the final version. That doesn't look quite right. It's not far off it. The problem is that this actual material, the actual material for the lava, is an emission as well. So it's giving off light in the process of actually being rendered. So what happens is that suddenly the object which is on the bottom half of the crucible and giving off light, so giving it a nice little sort of glow, which was something I was very happy with, suddenly it goes, it ramps up because now the material's or well, the fluid is right near the top of the crucible. So I had to find a way to solve that. And luckily, my client, again, wanted a very cheesy kind of introduction. And so as a result, I could put some sparks in there. So the actual sparks, um, I'm not sure if they're visible. They should be around here. Let's see. No, maybe they're not visible. But they are, as you, if you remember seeing the actual real video, you can remember there was sparks. And so I could cover up the change in lighting by the spark burst. So that's how I solved that problem. I was lucky because that may not work all the time. Um, so that's pretty much a lot of the challenges I have with the fluid sim. Now, the fluid sim is actually... The fluid sim is being replaced at the moment. Uh, there was a Google Summer of Code project uh, that was done to, in, to integrate a set of fluid simulation libraries called, I think it's called Mantaflow. Um, the, I know Google Summer of Code is actually just wrapped up uh, and there were, he had, the developer had a lot of troubles actually getting the libraries to work with Blender. So I don't know how long it's going to be before it will actually come into, um, into the master, into, uh, into trunk, actually no, trunk's an SVN, don't worry about that. Um, before it actually gets put in, 
uh, to an actual final release. But hopefully some of these issues will go away when, you act when this actually happens. Uh, one thing I might just cover off very quickly is just how I did that actual cheesy um, aspect to it. Because it, one of the things I actually do like compositing quite a bit, and uh, so there's a couple of, couple of tricks I used here to make life a little bit easier for me. Uh, so the actual, let me just share the screen again. So you can see here that I actually have a number of different scenes that are used for the different, different layers as such. So Cave BG is just the background. So as you can see here, this is just the background for it. Then I have another one, which is the pit smoke. So there's a, a layer of smoke. Yeah, I don't know why those objects are there. They shouldn't be there. But, uh, and that just has my, in the background, there will be a smoke. There is a smoke object. That's this object here. So it will generate the smoke. Um, when I was actually doing the fluid sim simulation, I actually put these are the only objects in the fluid sim. So what I would do is just basically generate my fluid sim here to try and keep down the geometry in the actual scene. The, each of these objects is actually linked. So they're linked across the different scenes. So this is my main render scene. It's crucible. This has everything. Uh, this stuff back here was early attempts to fix other problems. So I was trying to use booleans with the stuff that fell out of the bottom of the uh, crucible. Um, but the idea is that you end up rendering a series of frames and you can um, and then composite them together. So I actually have a compositing scene. Okay, compositing. And you can see the different layers here. Hopefully they can actually all load in. There we are. Hey, and it's even one with the sparks. Fantastic. So you can see this is one of the frames with the sparks here. And you can see, so we've got the background, we've got the smoke layer, and then we've got the front, the front which is just the crucible, this scene, and the other bits and pieces. So the, um, and you can see that this is done in the actual compositing nodes here. So you can see I've got the, probably a bit hard to see. That's the background. Again, by doing it this way, I can actually play with the different values. So in this case, I made it a bit darker, so there would be more contrast with the foreground. Alpha in the smoke. Then there is this is the actual. So you can see here that's the actual frame rendered with everything transparent, so that it cuts down the render time. Uh, these were taking about five minutes to render, I think, per frame. At least at this stage, once the full once the screen is fully um, filled with all of the, the the mold, it was taking up to an hour a frame to render. Uh, so yeah, that made things very slow. Um, but that's one of the reasons why I did this. So I could then the actual compositing takes about ten minutes from memory to composite all. It's about four hundred eighty frames. So to composite it together, sorry, there's two hundred twenty six frames for the initial sequence. The rest is the glow and so on. So it uh, took me uh, a while to get everything rendered, but it meant I could, once I did the rendering once, I didn't have to go back and re-render the whole thing, and I only had to render uh, just this crucible thing when I was playing around with it. Uh, just one thing uh, quickly. Uh, what I did, so I could just render the cave background once, is that if I find the camera, where's the camera? This one. This camera here is actually linked across all the scenes. So if I go to the pit smoke, um, I should see the camera here somewhere. So it's the camera pit smoke and so on, but they're all linked. So they're all using the same motion. So when I, whenever I change, if I did change it in the crucible scene, it would flow through to the cave background and the pit smoke. I'd have to re-render them, but I wouldn't have to worry about actually 
uh, setting up the camera identically in each of the different scenes. So that's about it. I might actually, so that's probably a few of the challenges that I had in my project. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll show you how I did that flash across the, and how I did the little sparklies as well. Because um, the sparklies are, I actually did the sparklies in the video sequence editor. So um, I'll show you the, how I did the sparklies first. Uh, and the idea is that I built these. Now, this, sorry, this might take me a little while to find, but uh, this will show you how I did them. So if I go to, just see if I actually, yes, I did do the edit here. So this is the actual sequence. And as you can see, we've got, these are the actual frames uh, that we generated. Uh, to do the transition, because I didn't have any easy way to get from one to the other, I did this very cheesy white flash, which you can see here, which is just a straight regular transition here. Uh, so if I just come in. So this is the cheesy white flash here. And then you have the rough scale logo. So again, this was an asset that was provided. Let's move that because it's probably appearing. So this was an asset provided by the Campaign Coins team. Now, what you can see is what I've got here is two other strips. And it's this little glare sequence here. And if I move the, there, you can see. So that's them appearing there and there. So hopefully you can see those two. Now, what I've done is this actual strip is just simply a, a glare strip. So I'll see if I can go find um, where I have put that. Sorry about this. Where have I put this? I may have actually put it way up here. Utility, there it is. Glare dot. Glare sequence. Ah, oh, of course, it's actually a set of PNG. And you can't see it very well on a white background either. <laughs> let's, um, let's actually uh, this little thing here. Sorry. Okay. Um, where is the image editor? We have a question. We have a question. Let me just, uh, just. So there we are. So you can see that I've got this glare dot here. And uh, unfortunately, I can't play the sequence because the sequ it's a PNG sequence. So you can see the PNG sequence here. And basically, what it does is so from it's from a little bit back to a little bit. It, so it sort of it basically grows and shrinks. Uh, the other thing I think it grows and shrinks. Or did I actually was it rotating? It's rotating. Sorry, it's just rotating. To actually put it into the sequence, so I added these 24 frames here. I then used the image offset here to actually position them. So if I drag this, you'll see. You should see, hopefully that it's disappearing off to one side or another. Now it's coming back the other way. So I positioned it using those image offsets. Let me just put it back. The other thing I did, so I had two of them. To make them come up and appear, I just basically played the sequence and I set this offset the sequence. So that's the way I made those two. So that happened in the video sequence editor. Anyway, so that's how I did the little glary things. So the question is, um, how did you like using the video sequence editor? And did you miss anything from other editing software or run into anything new? Uh, I quite like the video sequence editor and I use it on just about all of my productions. So I actually try and do everything in Blender where possible. Um, the Some of the things that I found a little bit challenging is that trying to stack effects sometimes doesn't make sense. 
there's sort of two ways to do effects. You can do a classic. Um, so if I just duplicate that. Come on, over here. So I select this, uh, add an effect. Oh, undo that. Thank you. So if I add an effect, say a, um, uh, just a, uh, Gamma cross. So now what will happen is it will do a gamma cross from this one that was selected first to this one. And that works fine, but when you try and stack three or four of those effects, because what you need to do is you need to, if you want to do another effect, you have to do it on top of this gamma cross effect. And then the, depending on what's at the top level will get will depend what you get, it can get a bit confusing. Um, and you, do, it, you don't always get exactly the result you want. So I found that is a little tricky. I prefer it that we just straight, there's another way you can do stuff, um, which is on this one, we just basically keyframe the, we keyframe the opacity. So as you can see, this is actually keyframed. Um, and then use an alpha over here as well. So I found that um, using that method can be easier than using the standard sort of like selection and, and effects. Uh, and then that kind of works better because then you can stack them all, all on top of each other. So that has worked better for me. So, um, that's it. yeah, cool. Uh, yeah, as far as that, there are some manipul there are some actual moving around things that I miss, but a lot of them are available through add-ons. So I use this jump to cut add-on. Um, I'm pretty sure it's a standard one. I think you, uh, you can, Download it if you if it's not standard, but I, I use this all the time. I find it really handy to, for the jumping between cuts, setting the ins and outs, and then just basically setting the start and end. So I use those buttons. I use all the time, uh, and I find them really handy. Cool, awesome. Thank you. So thank you for that question uh, from Durand. So.